Okay, hello, welcome back to another video. Today it is a special day. It is Valentine's Day, and so I wanted to celebrate this by paying homage to what I believe is the greatest or was the greatest era of chess, the Romantic Era. For those of you unfamiliar with the history of chess, the Romantic Era lasted from, I would say, the early 18th century to the late 19th century, um, and generally was considered to have reached its peak in around the 1830s with a man by the name of Louis Charles Mahé de la Bordenay. Now that is a very French name and a very long name. So from now on, I'm just gonna call him La Bourdonne, Um, And he is the protagonist of our video today. Before I go further into this video, I wanted to give you guys a sense of what romantic chess really is and hopefully encapsulate the spirit of this play style in just a few words. I think this is best done by saying that romantic players do not play for checkmate. They play for a beautiful checkmate. They consider winning far less important than winning in style. Generally speaking, the games of the Romantic era are categorized by a common elegance or, you know, an artistic nature uh, to the chess played. Until the late 20th century, the game of chess was entirely devoid of any computer input, meaning that while we as kids grow up nowadays uh, with quite an objective understanding of the game of chess, you know, we see moves as either blunders or best moves or, you know, we're told by Stockfish what to do and what to think. Back in the 1800s, the game was a lot more full of very exciting tactics, very dubious play, but very artistic play. Um, and I'm sure you can I'm sure you can guess that led to some very beautiful games. Today, I'd like to take you through one of my personal favorites played by Louis Charles Mahé de la Bordenay against a man named Victor Joseph Etienne de Jouy. This game was played in Paris in the year of 1838. And not only is a 17 move piece of art, but also was played by La Bordenay, blindfolded, and in a simultaneous exhibition, meaning he was playing multiple people at the same time while blindfolded. Without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, so La Bordenay started with the black pieces and Jury started with the white pieces, and he opened with the move E4. La Bordenay responds with the move E5, even in 1838. E4, E5 was a super common idea, uh, and it wouldn't be true of romantic era chess without the next move, F4. This is of course the King's Gambit and was very popular uh, in this era. I mean, for those of you who are familiar with the games of Paul Morphy, uh, who played a little later around the 1850s, I believe, uh, his most famous game, the Opera game, was in 1858 at Bellini's Opera. You know, he was a big, big fan of the King's Gambit. And the idea basically being to get the bishop out, uh, to get the knight out, to castle and put a lot of pressure straight away uh, on F7 going straight after the Black King. La Bordenay accepts the King's Gambit, of course, you got to accept the King's Gambit, and then after Knight F3 plays the move G5. This is one of the many reasons that I just love analyzing these old chess games, because G5 here is a move that is still played today at the highest level of chess. Hikaru Nakamura has had plenty of games um, in this line. Alexei Shirov has also uh, had plenty of games in this line. Nigel Short as well. It's very, very sharp. Very, very interesting. The immediate idea is to go straight for G4. The optimal response and critical move here uh, nowadays is H4, which is a really, really interesting looking move that generally speaking wasn't played much around that time. The idea, as I said, of this romantic chess was to go for bishop C4, to attack this king, maybe even sacrifice the bishop, you know, fling the knight in, get the queen in, um, and just have the sort of no mercy trying to create a beautiful checkmate. So instead, of course, we do see that move of bishop to c4, piling the pressure on f7. Um, obviously, the opponent wants to castle and get their rook here as well. However, La Bordenay plays g4. And it is here that Jui plays this move knight to e5. This is known as the Salvio Gambit. Basically, um, attacking this pawn twice. Also, more importantly, uh, going straight for f7 here with the knight, with the bishop. Maybe you can take with bishop. Um, but taken with knight, of course, uh, it comes with this huge fork here on the rook and the queen. Very, very scary stuff. Here we see the move queen to h4 check. This is the reason that the Salvio Gambit is a little bit dubious because it allows queen to h4, uh, which is the best move, of course, attacking the king. g3 is not possible um, because after f takes g3, yes, you can play, for instance, I don't know, bishop takes uh, f7. After the king moves up, white is just going to be left with this huge problem uh, of a discovery onto this king. Um, with the pawn push, maybe even attacking the uh, the rook here, or even pawn takes, uh, say the rook goes to here like this, then we could see pawn takes, um, and after the king moves, you know, we can take the rook with check. Not going to be a good idea to play uh, g3 in this position. Jui here instead responds with the move king to f1, just stepping across. This is absolutely still uh, the main line of the Salvio Gambit. However, you know, Labordene, he's getting, he's getting out gambited. I mean, we've seen a king's gambit, 
and we've seen a Salvio gambit from his opponent. What's going on? I thought Labordene was supposed to be playing the romantic chess. Well, he does here. He plays f3, and he meets Juiz Salvio gambit with a gambit of his own, the Cotrain gambit. Now, this was named after John Cotrain, was a Scottish player. Um, we'll talk about him in another video around the same time, um, and he pioneered this line. Really crazy stuff, going straight after the idea of maybe taking on g2, harassing this king even further, but it does allow knight takes f7. In this position, instead of immediately taking any action over here, I mean, to be honest, he's only got his queen. None of the pieces have actually been developed yet. Uh, so the blindfolded Labordene plays the move knight to c6, ready to get some pieces into the game. Jury plays the move d4 here. We see him claiming the center, getting this bishop ready to come out. And I mean, this king is so weak. The rook's not going anywhere yet. It doesn't look great for Labordene. Labordene goes for this move bishop to g7 here, which as you can see, attacks the d4 pawn twice. And so we just see a simple c3 defending that pawn in the center. Continuing the theme of developing minor pieces, we've seen knight c6, we've seen bishop g7. It's only right that we see knight to f6, developing that last knight. But now, Zhui thinks, okay, I mean, you know, you've played this Cotterine Gambit, you've given up the full rook. I'm going to take it. I mean, I want the extra material, thank you very much. Then we see d5. He doesn't even take this knight back. He just goes d5, which also hangs a pawn, by the way. Now, the point of this move, d5, and again, you have to remember, this is before engines. This is a romantic chess. We are looking for something a little bit dubious, but very, very exciting and artistic. This is not a great move, objectively speaking. Um, pawn takes absolutely does punish this. This knight now has to move knight a5, I believe, is Stockfish's best try. But here, instead of even taking this, instead of moving his knight, he goes knight to e4. Now, this is actually a terrible move. The stockfish evaluation is a plus six here, um, because after the move queen to e1, you don't want to trade queens here um, as black. I mean, if you trade the queens off, uh, let's see, queen takes and king takes. Let's just turn on the engine here. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's plus five as an evaluation. Um, you're going to have to probably try and save this knight. It's not going to be easy. Um, you know, to win this game down material without the queens, the king is going to become far less weak and you're not going to have a good time. So instead, Labordene doesn't want to trade the queens. He doesn't want to move his queen. His queen is beautifully situated. So he plays the move g3. Just, just getting in the way of this. Now, the reason that um, this initial idea of going knight to e4, or sorry, knight to e4 uh, was a bad idea is because here there is the move knight to d2. And it's really, really not obvious as to why this is so different to the move that we actually see Zhui play until we look at what happens in the rest of the game. So I'm going to come back to why this was a good move and why this actually would have saved the game for Zhui um, after looking at what he actually played. The move he actually played was bishop to d3. Now, in this position, far from being winning, I mean, bishop d3 seems completely reasonable. You've attacked the knight twice. It is pinned to the king here. I mean, how can this not be a good move? This knight is still hanging. Do you want to know what the evaluation is here? The Stockfish evaluation, and I won't use this much because I think it's it's better to uh, have a little bit more of an artistic approach when you're looking at romantic chess rather than looking at this objective evaluation. But just to give you a real sense of how crazy this is, minus 32 in favor of black, of course. The reason for this is, as Le Bordenay now shows, takes on here. Finally diffusing this tension, uh, making the most of the Cotrain Gambit. He played f3, he wants to take on here. And after the king takes... Why did he play d5? Not only to free up this space for the knight, perhaps, but bishop to h3. Frees up the bishop, the bishop comes in, and where can the king even go? In this position, the king has two legal moves now. Of course, king f3, uh, we will see queen g4. After king e3, the only move, bishop h6, would actually be a beautiful slicing checkmate here. Um, the pawn actually coming in handy holding that f2 square. So that is not possible. So here, Zhu is forced to play the move king to g1. He just steps back, of course, not blundering mate in two. But in this position, I, you will not guess. If you want to pause the video and try and guess what the next move is, please feel free. Uh, but don't think for too long because you will be wasting your time. Knight takes d4. Now, the point of this move, knight takes d4. I mean, first of all, can we just pause and look at the, the fact that these knights are just in the center of the board here. The bishop is cutting this off. The queen's here. The pawn is here. Like, just look at how the pieces are congregating uh, towards this white king. Anyway, the point is that if you take here, there is bishop takes with check. You then have to block with the bishop here. And after takes, king takes, you come back and check with the bishop. The bishop blocks here, king back, check with the queen, this goes back, and then you check mate. I mean, it's just a forced mating sequence. It's mate in six. 
Keeping in mind La Bordonnet was blindfolded, that kind of mate in six by force calculation, I don't even know if he will have calculated that, more so just trusting the process of after takes, takes, just thinking that, okay, if here, here, the king's forced to here, there's going to be some discovery, the bishop, the knight, the queen, you can generally speaking, just trust the pieces uh, to do the work for you. If you're kind to your pieces, they will be kind to you. Now, there is one more thing we need to look at here before we can go to the move actually played in the game, and that is if pawn takes here. Now, if you want to pause and find the move, you can do so. This one is much easier to find. It is knight to f3 checkmate. And as you can see here, it's the minor pieces that are doing the work. The queen is just sitting here hanging like a moron. The minor pieces have checkmated this king. Now, if we go all the way back here uh, to before the move bishop d3 was played, if knight to d2 had been played, then after takes, king takes, bishop h3, the king goes back, knight takes here, pawn takes, and the knight holds f3. In this position, by far the best move is pawn takes here, and the fact that it couldn't be played when the bishop was here because of this idea of knight to f3 meant that actually this then became uh, a lot more you know, exploitable for the black pieces. So knight b to d2, I think we can forgive Le Bordonnet for not seeing this. Um, again, this is more, we're more focused on the artistic element of this game. Happy Valentine's Day, romantic chess, remembering all that. So back to our critical position after Le Bordonnet takes here, uh, after pawn takes, bishop takes, obviously, as we just looked at, there would be forced checkmate. Instead, Zui thinks, okay, well, queen takes e4. And you hit the queen and you hit the king. And if the king moves, then surely, you know, surely you have to take it. Well, he does have to take here. And then after takes, the queens are traded. The queens are traded. What's going on? I mean, how th this isn't good. How is this a brilliant game? He's down eight points of material. No queens on the board. Checkmate. There is checkmate in this position with the knight. The pawn holds f2. The bishop holds f1 and g2. And the knight holds that g1 square, the rook suffocated by its own king, and the king suffocated by two minor pieces and a pawn here. Unbelievable stuff. Thank you very much for watching this video. Uh, if you enjoyed, leave a like, comment, subscribe, all of that. And I really appreciate a lot of feedback uh, in the comments. I really enjoyed making this video because uh, I enjoy, you know, looking at sort of chess history, but also, you know, romantic era chess is so fun to analyze and so just beautiful to look at. I mean, just look at this. He's down eight points of material. Anyway, um, Egad Mator has a great Paul Morphy saga, and I might take inspiration from that and do a Le Bordonnet saga and cover a lot more of this guy's games. Let me know if that's something that you'd be interested in watching, and I will see you in the next video. Happy Valentine's Day. Goodbye.